guys. My name is Ryan Lee. I'm currently uh, in high school and attend the Alexander Hensinger High School in Los Angeles, California. Uh, I'm very honored to be presenting my research to you all, and I apologize for not being able to present live due to uh, time constraints and differences in time zones. But um, that being said, I'm also very excited to share my findings with you all today. Um, and so with that in mind, I would like to start by discussing uh, OpenAI GPT-3 which is a new language model that can write literature and capture the nuances of a particular author's style from a corpus of text, chat convincingly, and abs answer abstract questions. And so the software is the latest episode in an upward spiral of data science and AI development. And as seen in the leftmost graph, it, stand, it stands as an unprecedentedly powerful software for text generation using approximately 175 billion parameters, which are essentially the um, values that a neural network tries to optimize during training. And so uh, for comparison, the brain utilizes around 100 trillion synapses. And so while uh, OpenAI uh, GBT3's model seems to be far from reaching the point of a human brain, it is still you know, an impressive model. Um, but so after following its development for some time, it came to my attention that in proportion with this rapid growth of artificial intelligence and increasing sophistication in data systems more generally, that there were also rising concerns associated with understanding the ethical uh, demarcations that participated in real world lamps, and more importantly, when and where such bounds should be considered in the developmental process. And so what I wanted to do is set out to find and critically analyze a methodological approach geared towards embedding ethical considerations at the primary stages of research and design for AI and other similar applications. So as a means of approaching this task, I decided to use a case study of a smart stadium project as a supplementary material for basing my critical interventions and ultimately using this study as the central underpinning for how I envisioned more productive ways of collaboration between technologists and STS, which stands for Science, Technology, and Society Scholars during the formulation of data systems. Interestingly enough, one of the biggest findings of my investigations was that technologists might not be completely apt to deal with ethical considerations alone. It was previously studied that technologists' ethical inconsiderations are products of the shortcomings of ethical training and engineering and computer science education, which essentially provided substantive context for why more robust ethical frameworks have not been significantly pursued in the past. And so before I discuss the uh, major results and findings of this study as a sort of necessary background for the Smart Stadium project itself, its aim is to essentially develop an openly accessible internet of things testbed as a means of accelerating the development of smart city technology solutions, utilizing different sensors and use cases, which, for example, were AI crowd behavior understanding models, sound monitoring, and demonstrator systems. And so with this, after analyzing the smart city project, one of the lead scientists was noted to have been well-versed in anthropology, initiated critical discussions on ethical and privacy issues of the project throughout. And so this allowed the data scientists to facilitate ethical development for the aforementioned use cases and also motivated investigations into making data processing in the cloud more secure and efficient, which subsequently allowed for that data to be conveniently stored and in turn used for the development of new smart technology services and better customer experiences. And so this STS intervention proved to be an ethically considerate and systemically productive decision and overall proved to be very beneficial for the formulation of the project. And so with these results, I was able to help the support the conclusion that ethical considerations at the primary stages of design and development are imperative in the procurement of improved practicality and safety of applications or projects that utilize smart technology, AI or data science. And so because data ethics serves the conversation between technology and social aspects, collaboration between STS scholars and data and machine learning scientists is optimal for the practice of ethics by design, of this ethics by design methodology. And so even though data scientists and uh, machine learning engineers frequently consider problems of data quality and data privacy, data biases and their societal, societal implications need to be investigated through discussion, consideration, uh, and recommendation as well. And so through this study, 
it was shown that an interdisciplinary approach in ethical debates is and sort of will continue to be increasingly pertinent given this very sharp rise in development of applications that utilize data sets like the OpenAI GPT-3 model and the very deep implications the resulting infrastructure will have in a myriad of social landscapes moving forward. And so with that said, in light of the current pandemic, urgently deploying applications that utilize data systems, for instance, automated fever scanners, self-diagnosing machines, and the like, uh, need to have some form of definitive ethical framework. And so now moving forward into the future, ethics by design has proven not in this step, not only in this study alone, but in many others that ethical considerations at the outset will allow for the need, much needed balance of uh, safety and practicality in data system applications. Um, and so that was sort of largely what my uh, research was about. Thank you very much once again. Uh, and yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Otto Fubé. I am a uh, senior at Maria Curio High School from Santa Rosa, California. And today I'll be presenting a research project done by me and two of my close friends, Dakshin Dia, which is titled Correlation of Heart Activity in Different Time Intervals Post Cardiac Arrest and its Response to CPR or Defibrillator Intervention. Before I go into the details of this research project, I would like to talk about why it came to be in the first place. And currently I'm 17 and about five years ago, so I was 12, um, I actually lost my best friend to cardiac arrest. And I was there and 20 other adults were there. And we were, we gathered around him, but there was nothing we thought we could do. And we just stood there. And um, that night, unfortunately he passed away. And I sort of looked at myself and I just felt so incredibly helpless. And I researched online, not expecting to find anything, but um, researching to find how I could have helped, how, um, if there was anything I could have done in that moment that could have helped my friend. And I was surprised to find immediately that CPR can double or even triple the chances of survival of a person who has suffered from a cardiac arrest. And to be quite frank, it at that time, and it still does bother me that not that many people know about CPR, considering that it is the number one cause of death in the United States and one of the leading causes of death all around the world. And so I wanted to educate myself on this, but I also wanted to learn th new things about this. And to do so, I reached out to uh, Mr. Tavari from um, the Sonoma State University. And along with my friends, we initially intended to uh, correlate time with CPR. Um, what I mean by that is that there are already enough um, researches done that show why CPR and how CPR can increase your chances of survival from blank percent to blank percent. And I sort of wanted to um, throw in the time aspect. Like if you do CPR in X minutes, the person's chances of survival will increase by 20%, 30%. And we wanted to look into that. Um, so initially, we looked for um, time from cardiac arrest to CPR and noticing the trend of survival rate. And we came to realize that there are so many other factors at play as well. Um, for example, EMS uh, arrival is has all the professionals who can give really good um service to the person who has suffered from a cardiac arrest so that they can increase their chances of survival. Um, defibrillation is a huge, huge um, factor in survival rate because CPR messes up your heartbeat and defibrillation is what brings it back to that stable, normal heartbeat. And so we realized that we really can't do justice to this question without first also incorporating all these different factors. And what we found was that this really similar um, downward trend and shows that the sooner you can get EMS arrival, defibrillation, CPR, uh, the higher the chances of survival of the person suffering from the cardiac arrest is. And while this was awesome, uh, we also noticed um, some spikes in the data. And what originally got to me was Kings County. Um, 
We also did different sample sizes of data. So not only did we get data from a county, but we also got it from the state and from uh, an entire country, Japan. And the overall trend was the same. But we did notice that there were spikes, um, say around three minutes in. There's a steep dip uh, after nine minutes. And I sort of wanted to know why. And I wanted to see what happens biologically. And so our research went even deeper into the biology underlying uh, cardiac arrest. So while I'm not going to give the entire details of every single timestamp, what we found out was that during cardiac arrest, your heart and your brain go unresponsive incredibly fast. And we found, we researched the biology of it and the specific um, things that happen in each timestamp. And they seem to explain the differences in dips and spikes. And overall, the message that comes from this data, this research, is that fast administration of CPR, of defibrillation, of calling EMS, is crucial for the survival rate of someone who suffered from cardiac arrest. Each minute can be the difference between life and death. Three minutes, if you waste, um, you find, find them, say, at, after they've suffered for two minutes. Like, three minutes in, your, their chances of survival go down by 15% in that small amount of time. And I would like to leave all of you guys off um, with uh, a reminder and sort of urging you guys to educate yourself on CPR on picking up the signs of when someone is suffering from uh, a cardiac arrest and knowing what to do in this situation. Because Maname, my friend who passed away, could have been, God forbid, one of your friends or your relatives or even a random stranger. And doing this fast and knowing the right technique to CPR can save someone's life. And especially because it is such a huge cause of death in our country and in the world, I strongly urge you guys to educate yourself on CPR further. Thank you so much for listening. Dear guests, esteemed members of the Young Scientist Journal and the beloved sponsors, thank you for making this conference possible. I am Tuna Soy and I'm 19 years old. I just graduated from Istanbul Marmara High School and I'm proceeding with my uh, education at the University of Bologna in Italy. Actually, my twin sister just flew to Italy today and I was planning to flew today too, but uh, I canceled my flight uh, in order to attend to this conference. Anyways, to get to the main point, uh, I started this project in 2018 and it was for a national science fair. Afterwards, I improved my project report and uh, I enhanced uh, my article to be published at the Young Scientist Journal, where I met all the great people from the team, from the editorial team. Uh, I met lots of great people at the Young Scientist Journal. Finally, I'm happy to be able to present my project to all the attenders. So, the name of my project is Biodegradation of styrofoam by gut bacterium, exiguo bacterium, find in the digestive tract of the larva of Sophobus morio. At the first glance, it sounds a little bit scary, I know, but don't worry, I will explain everything. Styrofoam is a type of plastic which is made of foamed polystyrene. I believe everyone who is watching my presentation has at least used a styrofoam products once. Styrofoam is commonly used by heat insulation packaging, and for uh, single-use dishes. But styrofoam vest has an extensive negative effect on the environment, and these negative effects contribute to the global warming in the long term. Since styrofoam is considered as non-recyclable and non-biodegradable, uh, it creates a colossal accumulation of plastic waste. A recent research showed that um, styrofoam residue is found in the 100% of fat tissue in human body. So we are poisoning ourselves. By ourselves, I don't mean the humanity. I mean all the living creatures on the planet Earth. This disaster should come to an end. Luckily, the main character of this research project, 
The larva of the Phobos Morio, as known as Super Worm, has an incredible skill. It can, wait for it, happily eat and digest styrofoam. As a tribute to this incredible ability of Sophobos Morio, um, I designed and created the video. Google Organic has the ability to feed on styrofoam without getting damaged. In fact, they are able to live longer when they are eating styrofoam compared to their natural diet. In this research project, I analyzed the styrofoam consumption of Sophobus Morio, and to do so, I procured 500 Sophobus Morio and I separated them into um, 10 groups of 50. The careful measurements of the experiment show that 100 Sophobus Morio can eat and digest 148 milligrams of styrofoam per day. As an end product, they produce this biodegradable waste, which is totally unharmful to the nature. You can use it as a uh, fertilizer. This result indicates a promising future for getting rid of the styrofoam waste. By carefully building styrofoam biodegradation facilities, we can do it. We can achieve our goal together. We cause this plastic pollution and it's our duty to clear our mass. Thank you for listening. First up to speak live is Satvika, and she will be talking about the relationship between musical structures and birdsong. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here today. I'm Sarthita Krishnan and I've just completed my studies at Bablake School in Coventry in the UK. And today I'll be talking about the relationship between musical structures and birdsong. Uh, next slide, please. Um, birdsong has inspired musicians from all around the world for many, many generations across a wide range of genres. And in keeping with the theme of timelines, uh, various composers have been influenced by the songs of birds throughout history of music. From classic romantic Beethoven to contemporary Messiaen with his Catalogue de Oiseau, to jazz musician David Rothenberg, and many other musicians, they've taken direct or indirect references to the models of birdsong and incorporated it in their pieces. The purpose of birdsong is for communication and Slater defines communication as the signal that causes modified behavior of the receiving animal. Bird vocalizations can broadly be split into two main categories, calls and songs. Calls are short and simple, and they usually denote a meaning like, uh, get away from my nest, or, I'm hungry. Whereas songs are more long and complex and often used by males in breeding season. Now, when discussing musicality, musicality is very hard to define, but it can be broadly split into five main components. Melody, harmony, rhythm, articulation, and structure. Structure, there are two types of structures. Uh, first, there's melodic and motivic. Now, studies have been done to compare the first four elements from music and birdsong, and melodic structure has also been studied. However, the primary objective of my study was to research a different and motivic aspect of structure in relation to birdsong. Now, birds produce sound by using a uniquely avian organ known as the syrinx. And the syrinx is located at the bifurcation of the trachea, where it splits into the two primary bronchi of the lungs. Um, passerines, uh, also known as songbirds, are an order of the avis class. And passerines tend to have more complex songs. And within the passerine order, there are two suborders, the ossines and the subossines. The ossines have very complex syrinxes and are known as the true songbirds. And they have highly developed songs due to their syringal muscles. And these syringal muscles can translate motor commands into syringal behavior, which in turn produces sound, song. The ossines are also able to modify uh, sound production with their vocal tract. Sub-ossines, on the other hand, have very simple syrinxes, and in fact, their syrinx is restricted to the trachea. Therefore, they're known as tracheophone. 
In addition to the syrinx, respiratory muscles affect the acoustic properties of vocalizations by the adjustment of pattern, frequency, and amplitude of ventilation. Birds living in dense vegetation often have low frequency sounds, so actually the habitat can affect the complexity of birdsong. This is because low frequency sounds travel long distances and are less likely to be affected by vegetative interference in comparison to higher frequencies. This is why forest birds often have simple whistles and simple calls, whereas open country and grassland birds, including various species of sparrow, have very complex and buzzy songs because these aren't distorted by um, vegetation or wind conditions. And this is predicted by the acoustic adaptation hypothesis, also known as the AAH. Next slide, please. So I decided to incorporate these three elements, structure, habitat, and species. And these, this is my final question. Can musical structures be applied to bird song? Does the habitat of the species affect the complexity of the structure? And does the taxonomical suborder affect the complexity of the structure? So first, I have to define what structural complexity is. I define structural as complexity based on song density. So song density is the number of motifs per 10 seconds. I also define structural complexity based on the intersyllable frequency shift. This is the difference in frequency between motifs. For example, if there is a unidirectional frequency sweep, as in the banded wren song, you have a larger intersyllable frequency shift. I also use the intersyllable gap length, which is the rest period where syringal muscles can realign. Next slide, please. So in order to Yeah, in order to identify and organize bird songs into structures, I, I created a list of 80 bird species. These were all passerines and they were organized into two habitat types, open country and woodland. There were 40 open country birds and 40 woodland birds, and these were paired based off genus. Then this allowed me to compare uh, the complexity of structure based on habitat location. The species were then further divided into two categories, ossines and sub -ossines. I had 30 pairs of ossines and 10 pairs of sub -ossines. And this allowed for comparison between birds with developed syrinxes and those with simple syrinxes. Using recordings from an approved birding website, xenocounter.com, and the sonogram for each recording, I listened to the audio and used the sonogram and I, and I identified a structure for each bird song. I used three recordings per species to reduce error, and I used a 10 second time span to ensure the consistency across all species tested. Structural identification was achieved by giving each motif an alphabetical letter, like the, uh, like the method used in Western classical music. If possible, I also gave a qualitative musical description, for example, the presence of a unidirectional frequency sweep, which indicates a large interval to intersyllable frequency shift, and the presence of a longer gap length between motifs. I use Fisher's exact test to test for statistical significance, but as I only use 10 pairs of sub ossines in comparison to the 30 pairs of ossines, all my sub ossine data was multiplied by a factor of three. And then the data was iterated proportionally to match the other data set and was tested using Fisher's exact. Next slide, please. Here is the, um, an, the analysis of the Eurasian wren, troglodytus troglodytus, and you can see the way I've used the sonogram and I used the audio to split based off motif. Heading over to my results now. Um, my results were... Uh, I, I, sorry, my structure was determined by changing, repeating, and connecting motifs, and therefore I could identify structure in all songs. It's important to note that contrast may not necessarily be between motifs, but within the motif itself. Hammer, I noticed a single motif comprising of a two-note clicked trill. The most frequent form of contrast observed in the study was through variation of frequency or pitch. And every song that I tested involved repetition of at least one motif. Interestingly, almost all the ossines and sub ossines that I tested used silence to connect their sections together. However, some ossines, like the, like the Eurasian wren we saw, uses a stream of clicks to connect their motifs together. 
Observations of the sub scenes show that songs often only contain one or two motifs with longer gap lengths, and a large intersyllable frequency shift was most common in Ossines rather than sub -ossines. The iterated data, which is not shown in the table, was tested for statistical significance, and the Fisher's exact test showed that the association between taxonomic suborder and motif number was statistically significant. Open country birds tend to have longer, uh, shorter gaps, sorry, and they usually connect their motifs with a continuous stream of clicks. And you're more likely to find a large intersyllable frequency shift in open country. Although that's not statistically significant, there is a trend towards birds living in open country habitats having more complex structures based on song density in comparison to their woodland cousins. To conclude, all birds have musical structure in their bird song. More complex, um, more complex songs are usually found in Ossines, um, and this is also to st statistically significant in comparison to sub Ossines, which matches the original hypothesis. Although there is no statistical data significance for the data collected, it does suggest a trend in the relationship between habitat and structural complexity, as predicted by the AAH. These results and the results from my study can be used to monitor the effects of deforestation and habitat loss. These are two of the biggest threats affecting biodiversity today. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. I'd like to thank uh, particularly Dr. Martin, the Strickland Curator of the Natural History Museum of the University of Cambridge, for his guidance and insightful suggestions through this project. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the staff of Bab Lake School, Coventry, for their continued support in my academic career. A special thank you goes to my mother, grandmother and aunt for all their encouragement and chauffeuring. And thank you to the YSJ team for organising this fantastic conference. And I'd like to leave you with this quote by um, my hero, Sir David Attenborough. What wild creature is more accessible to our eyes and ears, as close to us and everyone, in, and everyone around us, as universal, as a bird. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophika, for that wonderful presentation. Finally, we have Kathika Neha, who will be talking about growth conditions and biosynthesis. Hi, my name is Geetika Badala. My name is Neha. And this is our project on the effects of differential growth conditions and environmental stress factors in reactive oxygen species and polyphenol biosynthesis in Salvia rosmarinus. Uh, next slide, please. Polyphenols are an emerging. Next slide, please. Polyphenols are an emerging area of study. These organic compounds have been found to lower the deficits caused by Alzheimer's disease by weakening the oxidative stress caused by the accumulation of beta amyloid plaque in the brain. Nutritional intake of polyphenols in a diet has been found to weaken this stress, modulate signaling pathways, and reduce the risk of AD by improving cognitive function. Many medicinal plants, such as herbs, fruits, vegetables, and even oils, contain large amounts of these molecules to help cope with things such as stress, growth, and defense, including rosemary, which contains four types of these molecules. Altering the plants to produce more polyphenols can be beneficial to aid in other areas of studies as well. Next slide, please. As we talked about briefly before, polyphenols help counteract stressors. Oxidative stress in plants occurs due to excessive production of reactive oxygen species, or ROS. Polyphenols help interact with ROS and enzyme reactions and reduce the catalytic activity of enzymes involved in ROS generation. This also helps protect plants from UV irradiation and other pathogens. Next slide, please. So Taxol is actually a cytotoxic cancer chemotherapy drug that's derived from the Pacific yew tree. And Previously, only a small quantity of this compound was produced by each tree 
which made the drug too expensive and ecologically costly. However, scientists were able to alter the environmental conditions of the Pacific yew tree, such as the pH, water activity, and elicitors of different concentrations to successfully enhance the production of taxol. And this is where we drew our inspiration from when altering our different stress factors in rosemary plants to induce increased polyphenolic production. Next slide, please. In order to identify which stress factor positively affects polyphenol production the most, we stressed out three rosemary plants using saline solution, UV irradiation, and hydrogen peroxide, and also kept a control plant with deionized water. The UV plant was placed under an ultraviolet lamp and watered with 400 ml of deionized water every day. The stall stress plant and the hydrogen peroxide plant were watered with a saline and hydrogen peroxide solution, respectively, increasing solute concentration from 25 millimolar to 300 millimolar over the course of eight days. All four of these plants were kept under a growth light to stimulate the sun, which was turned off at night to mimic the 12 hour day and night. Next slide, please. As you can see above, here are the four rosemary plants on the first day of inducing stress onto them. Next slide, please. After two weeks of stress, we noticed a significant change in all the plants. The saline stress plant was growing away from the light and was studded with salt crystals. The UV plant had almost translucent leaves and was more white. The hydrogen peroxide plant grew the most, especially noticeable in the leaves, compared to the other plants, and the control grew steadily. Next slide, please. After the growth period, we used the colorimetric fox assay to measure the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in the plants over the course of two weeks. The role of hydrogen peroxide in plants is to complement or antagonize many cellular, cellular regulatory circuits by active interactions with other signals and plant hormones during growth, development, and stress responses. Next slide, please. Start at the assay. We froze 10.2 gram samples of each plant and then used a mortar, mortar and pestle to crush the plants along with the extraction solution. Next, each sample's mass was measured again using a scale in order to preserve the same mass. The samples were then centrifuged and the supernatant was collected and pipetted into Eppendorf tubes. To every one milliliter of supernatant, one milliliter of working reagent was added. Later, the absorption rates of all 40 samples were then measured at 560 nanometers using a UV-vis spectrophotometer and the concentration of hydrogen peroxide was later calculated with the extinction coefficient to determine the stress. Next slide, please. After using the extinction coefficient to find out the hydrogen peroxide and react reactive oxygen species produced as a result of stress, we found the average of all 10 samples in each of the four plants. Our control yielded the least ROS concentration, which is understandable since we didn't add any stresses to it. The saline plants contain the most, which shows that they were stressed out the most. During salt stress, many metabolic processes such as photosynthesis and protein synthesis are hindered, which could have an effect on polyphenol production, which is also what we measured in the next assay. Next slide, please. A full CLCO2 assay, or FC assay, is used in order to quantify the polyphenol compounds. In our case, we need to find the amount of polyphenols in each of the rosemary plants. This will allow us to see the result of which stress factor produces the most polyphenol compounds. Next slide, please. To start the FC assay, we extracted the polyphenols by crushing 30 grams of each rosemary plant and isopropanol together using a blender and acetone and left on a stir plate overnight. Later, the extractions were placed in a Buchner flask and vacuumed, separating the liquids from the solids. These solutions were azeotroped in a rotary evaporator until there was only a small amount of solvent remaining. After the extraction process, each solution of polyphenol material was added to a cuvette with isopropanol, FC reagent, and water. These cuvettes sat for 30 minutes, and meanwhile, a blank was created to help identify absorbance rates. A spectrophotometer was then used to figure out the absorbances as well as quantify the value of polyphenols. Next slide, please. The Beer's Law plot of gallic acid was used as a standard in finding total polyphenolic content. We noticed that the control contained the most total polyphenol concentration, while the most oxidatively stressed plant, saline stressed, contained the least total. We did not expect this because polyphenols are used to counteract stresses, 
but the control had not been stress-induced. Next slide, please. We originally thought that the polyphenol production would positively correlate with the oxidative stress, but it was the contrary, as shown in the linear correlation above. Next slide, please. After carrying out the bioassays, we also conducted an in vitro screening of the four stressors in the plants and found out their effects on the amyloid beta-42 protein that's found in Alzheimer's. First, we started off by adding 20 microliter buffer into all of the wells in the microplate, and then we induced the peptide with our own polyphenolic extractions from the four different plants that we grew and stressed. Next slide, please. Later, we scanned the microwell plate into the spectrophotometer that measures absorbance and put the plate into an incubator in intervals of 15 minutes to heat the protein up to body temperature. After each interval, we put it back in the spectrophotometer to get accurate data, as shown in the next slide. From the results, you can see that over time, the UV stress plant has the most change in absorbance at 405 nanometers. Also notice that the salt stress plant decreased in absorbance, and as you can can see in the, the graph above, above had the most effect on the human amyloid protein as it had the least absorbance. Next slide, please. After calculating the hydrogen peroxide and amount of oxidative stress in each plant, we discovered that stress and polyphenolic content varies indirectly with each other, at least according to our results. This could be because of several reasons one of which that the short stress time would have shut down the plant's biosynthetic capabilities. We also did some further research and found that some stressors, like salt, inhibit metabolic processes until they are relieved. Regarding the screening of the beta amyloid protein along with rosemary, we noticed that salt and the hydrogen peroxide extraction had a negative effect on the aggregation of the amyloid beta protein, which would be extremely beneficial in people with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. As aforementioned, we noticed that the control contained the most phenolic content, which is the opposite of what we predicted. The plants under induced stress would contain the most polyphenols. However, overall, through understanding polyphenols, their biosynthesis, and how to increase their yield, we can learn more about their medicinal properties and potentially develop cures to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Thank you for listening. Okay, so well done guys and thank you all for your presentations. They were all really interesting and I'm sure everybody thoroughly enjoyed them as I can see there's a lot of applause in the chat. Thank you to our judges which have been overlooking what's been going on during this session and our prizes should be announced during the closing session at 3.30. Meanwhile, go to Discord to ask our presenters any questions you may have. Thank you all for coming to this poster presentation session. And our lunch session involving, involving Cahoots will begin shortly. And I'll put the link to that in the chat. Thank you.